Alternative 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. Now your host, Nick Nanavati. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Art of War podcast. I am your host, Nick Nandavati, and today I have such an exciting episode for you. This one is honestly, truly near and dear to my heart. I'm going to interview someone which you may not have heard of, someone whom you may not expect to be up here, but believe me, they have every right to be. Kasra Bushidar. Kas, how you doing? I am so great, thanks. How are you, Nick? I'm doing great. It's so wonderful to have you. So let me do a little introduction of this show and you and all this. For those of you who are listening, this is the Art of War podcast. This is a two-part show. Part one is what you're listening to right now. We're going to get to know top-level competitive Warhammer players who've won big tournaments, who've won, gone undefeated, they've really kicked butt. And we're going to break down exactly how they tick, how they viewed the game, what their play styles are, how they operate, where, they're, where they come from, like what makes a great 40K player. We're going to get to know Cass today. And then in part two, Cass... Well, let me introduce the man, the myth legend right now. He is a diehard Ultramarine player. He is a fluff bunny. He is a painter. He's a hobbyist. He's a lore master. He has no business on the top levels of competitive 40K (laughs) up until very recently where he's absolutely dunked on so many people. He's got, he's leveled up. He's a super soon now. He's all three, the triple threat, excellent sportsman, excellent player, excellent painter, member of the Art of War ITC team coming off a major tournament win best overall, and then doing so with Ultramarines, an army is near and dear to his heart. He is long, try-hard, boy in blue, and uh, it's amazing. It's so good to see. Cass, how you doing? I am I am smiling from ear to ear after that intro. <laughs> <laughs> As you should be. So in part two, this is going to be for subscribers only. You can join on AOW40K.com. That is our Patreon. Uh, that's where you can get access to part two of the show. Uh, that is where we're going to go into the deep, gritty details. We're going to figure out exactly how Cass's Ultramarine list works, how he pilots this for a variety of different armies in the field, a variety of different foes at various skill levels, and exactly what this toolbox he's created is and how it all works, how it comes together. So if you're interested in learning competitive 40K, learning about Ultramarines, and learning about Cass, stick around and find out. Cass, I'm super excited. I'm so excited to be here, man. I awesome. mean, uh, I didn't get here without a little bit of help. <laughs> We're going to figure out exactly how you got here. Tell me about your glorious Ultramarines and how you got into this game. Well, I I mean, I got into this game when I was just a wee lad. I was nine years old. I was visiting my with my with my mom and my sister. We were visiting my mom's best friend who lives in Germany. They had a son that was a few years older than me, and he was he was painting these miniatures, and I just... I was obsessed. I was like, what the hell are you doing? And uh, my birthday happened while I was there, and he gave me a Space Marine Librarian model. And, and I brought this thing back from, from Germany. This is, this is like when I was nine, the internet was not what it was. So I come back with this, with this story of this game, and I'm telling all my friends. And I remember, uh, like, I, th- I think it was a year later, I was, I was doing like back to school shopping with my mom at the mall. And there was a games workshop grand opening. And I just ran. I just ran up and my mom, you know, chases me into the store. And I was like overstimulated. Just I knew I had to I knew I had to play this game. And uh Space Marines were were calling me. And so I saved up my allowance money and I bought that second edition starter set. And uh, you know, there was there was a brief hiatus at one point where I went over to fantasy battles, but Space Marines and, and Second Edition, that's really where this all started. So even as a little nine-year-old cast, you were, you knew you were going to end up here one day? I, I, you know what, not from a competitive gaming standpoint, to be honest. Uh, my love was, my first love was the hobby. And really, you know, it's, it's funny, I still have one of the first models I ever painted. It's an Ultramarines captain. And... You know, I, I'm thinking about how old it was when I painted this thing. I mean, I look at it now, it's fairly basic, but you could tell I put in the, the effort. And, and really, that's been what's driven me uh, throughout all of the different game systems I've played, etc. It has, it has been the, the painting side and, and perfecting that art. So 
it's uh, it's not something I expected to be on Art of War talking about competitive <laughs> success. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, I've, I've looked at your models. I've seen them in person. I've seen them in picture. They are absolutely stunning. You have an Instagram, right, where you post all your stuff? I do. It's Cass underscore paints. And you can... Uh, it's it's starting to become more about just my hobby in general, my gaming as well. But yeah, you can see all my my minis that I lovingly paint and post up there. It's absolutely wonderful work. Anyone who's interested in checking out those models, go check it out. Cass underscore paint on Instagram. But uh, Cass, let's get a little bit more to the storyline here. You're a painter. You're a hobbyist. You're you have beautiful models that are on an Instagram channel. These are not the qualities that typically find someone on the Art of War podcast. So how did you transition from developing your hobby and love for the game that way and developing your hobby skills into also becoming a monstrosity on the tabletop? Well, I think that that kind of goes back to where I was doing my gaming was a relatively casual gaming club. Uh, We played a lot of Crusade, actually, and I was kind of dominating that. And had a, had a few friends get a little salty at me about being a broken power gamer with my broken ultramarines, which I knew was never the case in mind. How uh, could you? How could you I, beat up these crusaders with your ultramarines? <laughs> I'm a bad man, Nick. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I kind of got tired of the, the casual scene and I thought, you know what, let's try our hand at competitive. And I just got obliterated the first couple tournaments I went to. And yeah, that's when I decided I needed to put out the bat signal for some help. So a lot of players, when they go to their first competitive tournament, or even before they do, when they're in that more casual crusader type narrative style, you know, there there's negative stigma. I think that exists amongst that, amongst certain players that tournament competitive play is all brutality and negativity and power gaminess. And everyone's a gotcha, win and all cost player. So is your, in your experience as a hobbyist who played crusade games, go into their tournament. Did you find any of that or do you have a different experience? I honestly found the opposite to be true. I have found that the higher level competitive games and events that I've gone to, I am having just a more civilized time. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it at length, but like a great example is the game I had with Marshall Reeves at the top table at the end of the tournament that we're talking about here. You know, it's, it's, it's a gentleman's game and Take backs are happening. You know, we're we're at the end of a uh, a very long tournament in a hot venue, and it's scorching, and there's no AC. So, you know, there's there's a little bit of leeway that goes a long way that I did not receive in my casual days. So, I found the competitive players. You know, as long as you're going in there with good intent and having the conversation, I find competitive players to be very reasonable for the most part. There's obviously exceptions to every rule, but that's been my experience. Nice. Okay. So you went to your first tournament and you it it went not so well? Yeah, not so well. And I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say my first tournament. I would I used to go to maybe one or two tournaments a year. Um, you know, I, I would take whatever list I was kind of running and, and do what I could. But the the first few that I went with the intent of actually playing competitively, you know, at best I was going two and three. But the losses were big losses, and I, I knew I needed to uh, focus on different aspects of the game. I did have some friends that were a little bit more competitively minded, so I tried to get reps in with them and pick their brain. And you know, it was uh, it was I, I realized I needed to level up. So once you made that decision, you're like, okay, I'm tired of going to tournaments and going two and three. There's something I'm just not clicking with me. I'm not getting the game properly. Um, there's a lot of ways players can progress from that frustration. And then I find it very common. A lot of players just accept it. Some players kind of fall out of competing. Some players just grind and get better through time. You took a a little bit of a different approach of jumping into the deep end. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah, well, I I think a key reason I did what I did was I had zero plans on chasing the meta. I, you know, I I spent probably four, four years or so Working on this Ultramarines army, the Gulliman model that I insist stubbornly on using in every single list is the best thing I've ever created with a paintbrush. So, you know, I, I was very much dead set on I'm playing Ultramarines and I'm playing Gulliman, but I want to do better. So I, you know, I'd heard about this organization, the Art of War. And actually, I was at LVO uh, the, the last year that Richard won. and. 
like I, again, I wasn't competitive, but I was there. I was at that tournament. And I remember the hype around that win and, and just, it made me look into who you folks were. And I, I obviously had heard, heard names. And I didn't know that much about it as I wasn't that competitively minded. And actually I, uh, I decided, look, I'm going to, I'm going to hire on some coaching. I've done this in other aspects of my life. I'm not, uh, I, I'm definitely a, a lifelong student in every way, shape or form. I had a painting coach. So why not a gaming coach? And went on uh, the Art of War website and I was looking at your guys' bios and you stuck out to me because you said that you approach this game with a toolbox mentality. And that has always been how I've wanted to build my army lists. And so that's, that's why I gave you a, gave you a shout. Very much appreciated. Only I'm not going to try to make this, this uh, podcast about the coaching that I've given you or, or, you know, my services more than it needs to be, but I appreciate that aspect of the story. Um, you, you said that my bio, which is what drew you into coaching with me specifically, as opposed to all of our other coaches who have their own bios, is for that toolbox mentality sort of approach to the game. To you, what does that mean? Well, I, I've typically, even before when I wasn't that competitive, and even now, I write lists differently than most lists you'll see. Because I, I don't... I don't necessarily bring, you know, as much of the best thing as I can. I'll bring units with with purposes in mind for them and versatility kind of overall in my in my fundamental list building strategy. So that I can, you know, I I don't ever get mad if I lose a game of Warhammer. What does upset me is if I feel like I never had a chance based off of my army. And so that's that's what I'm trying to eliminate when I'm building a list. And that's, in my opinion, the toolbox approach is just having an answer to most things in this game. Whether it's the best answer or not, doesn't matter. But having that answer. Yeah, I would describe it, and when I wrote it in my bio years ago, I described it as having a variety of units, tools, options, whatever you want to call it, a toolbox, having so many different things in your army that you can figure out the specific situation you're in and pull out the right tool or a tool for the job, as opposed to just spamming the most efficient stats or the mathematically best units, which are obviously great at what they do, but they're only going to function at the things that they're mathematically good at functioning at. Whereas taking a variety of units means, okay, I don't need a hammer for this problem. Let me use a wrench, you know? Yeah. So in terms of your marriage to Gilliman, and ultramarines and this toolboxy style army approach where you like to take a variety of different units. This is a fairly tall order, right? Like you, you are almost stuck between a rock and a hard place where you're frustrated. You want to get better. You're going two and three, but you're married to what you're playing with. And you, you self diagnose that you really don't like when your army doesn't have a chance. And obviously when you play kind of subpar units or pigeonhole your, was designed by external factors, you might end up in that situation. Yeah. So with with respect to the coaching, and you can tell this part of the story, and then how you progressed as a player, how, how did you start overcome that? Well, I think, honestly, step one was setting realistic goals. Um, you know, knowing that my hobby skills were at a point that I was, I was pretty comfortable competitively with my painting skills. You know, I, I, I do think painting subjective and there's rubrics and, you know, I'll sometimes get, you know, top marks and I'll, I'll be number one. Sometimes I won't even make it to the final cut. That's just how she goes with the subjective thing, but I'm confident in my painting skill. I know that I'm a good sport and I, I genuinely, I play this game for fun. You know, I, that's why I'm doing it. So I was, I was really targeting best overall as where I was going to shine because I saw that based off of my hobby scores and my sportsmanship scores and tournaments that track that, I was pretty high up on that overall list despite going two and three. Um, so really, I, I think I actually, when we talked on our first call, I told you my goal is to go from two and three to three and two. So I, I wasn't aiming for the stars. Um, and really what that enabled me to do was make that incremental progress and get that momentum. So once I went three and two, I didn't want to stop. It was like, oh, 
I see the path to better than this. And, uh, and yeah, that, that momentum was really, um, was really a, a joyful thing and, and definitely made me want to chase that dopamine. <laughs> Yeah, of course. So basically, you saw little bits of progress in your gameplay. I mean, not only in which translated into results on the tabletop, going from two and three to three and two, but you you viewed the game in different lights, which allowed you to see the path to go from three and two to four and one. And that's you know why not take the next step on that journey, basically. Absolutely. Cool. So with respect to your ultramarine specifically, and again, this, this toolbox style where your your list is obviously going to be a limiting factor being married to ultramarines with Gil- Gilliman, how do you, how did you get better? How did you learn to deal with the fact that you have these tools? There are broken armies, tyranids, whatnot in the meta. Like, how do you possibly compete? Well, I think, again, it kind of goes back to that toolbox of never having a matchup that's so bad that it's unbeatable. I can have uphill ones, you know, but I always, for, for Tyranids, it was, it was little weird tech pieces that I ended up with. I, uh, if you look at actually even the roster we'll be talking about later, but I love me a double devastator squad and a drop pod. Well, the loadout of that squad's changed a lot since I started coaching with, with you and, and, uh, and playing these games. When Tyranids were out is when a heavy bolter and a missile launcher found their way in there for those strats so it's like okay you have a harpy it's dead <laughs> next question right and and so i have all these little little tech pieces for the meta armies i have gotten you know there's so much good content out there art of war uh war room content but but again there's so many podcasts and 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 shows that you can kind of consume this content see what's winning in your area see what's winning overall and and my list has constantly kind of gone back and forth, adapting, throwing these little tech pieces in. But also, what what fundamentally changed, and, and I think the biggest change from where I started to where I am now, is I think of scoring first. I used to approach the game, especially coming from my casual crusade side, as like, okay, how do I kill, and how do I kill at range quickly? But my my perspective shifted it's it's like okay i don't need to kill you to win this game i don't need to play your game how do i score points so against some armies i'm i'm playing a secondary plan that you'd more likely see with like eldar or harlequins sometimes i am the big strong army that's holding the center and you're not going to get past me but i i found that being able to adapt my scoring plan to work against my enemy and give me a, give me that shot has been kind of the the key uh, to to kicking it up a level. That's awesome. Yeah, the I, you hit the nail on the head with, with the mentality shift because that's really what I was trying to get at. And I'm glad you answered it. Basically, when you're not very good at Warhammer, and we'll qualify, you're starting out with the coaching days of two and three. It's not very good, dude. Your approach can be all over the place because there's no guide or booklet that tells you how to do it unless you go and read you know art of war or whatever other thing was telling you how to do it so you just start with where you start and oftentimes people learn the game mechanically which is just like this is how you roll dice this is how you shoot somebody and from there tactics and strategy kind of evolve into i, I should shoot you and hopefully you die but yeah. ultimately competitive one hammer isn't about that at all like i mean obviously that's the mechanism but the strategy in the game comes down to the scoring, the positioning. Why are you doing these things? How will it translate into your actual win conditions? And, and sometimes even, I, I sorry to interrupt, but sometimes please do. it's even like, okay, I'm taking this secondary. I know I'm not going to score that well on it, but I'm forcing you to do a certain action. Like banners, you have to come to me now. You don't want to come to me. You have to, right? So you can even look at it past just scoring and more to behavior. Like, what behavior am I encouraging or discouraging by by leveraging the secondaries? So I would say through, and this is because I've been your coach, I've definitely instilled into you a similar mindset and approach to the game, which is like, figure out your points, focus on the scoreboard, figure out your situations, don't view things in necessarily a stereotypical conventional sense, you know, advance your shooting unit if it gets it into the right spot, as an elementary <laughs> example. And what you just said, you know, take banners, even though it's not a good score because it forces your opponent to you, is a, is a cause and effect kind of thing. Like if this, then that. So, stylistically, how would you t- 
take that toolbox approach and really apply it to yourself as a player? Like, what is your play style? Adap- adaptability, I, I think, is really what it comes down to. I don't, I don't really, I don't do well when there's when I'm forced into a box. And I'll, I'll tell you, when Codex Warfare was, you know, unlimited for each doctrine, and everyone was rushing out. And basically, Iron Hands, you know, it was made for Iron Hands and, and other heavy doctrine marine chapters. I, I did try that approach and I hated it because it was not like I just got rushed down by melee armies and uh, because I had to bring all these heavy weapons and try to max out that secondary. And it was it was kind of an experiment for me, but it, it solidified for me that my play style comes from having a bit of a jack of all trades approach to the game. And so, you know, I, 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 I'm not married to it specifically, but I typically end up running a lot of infantry, a lot of trash, um, if you will. Like, I love troops. I love OPSEC. And, you know, a lot of people will look at my lists and say, it doesn't have a lot of teeth to it. I don't understand how it works. But that's because I am literally working so hard to get every little bit of juice out of every unit I'm, I'm taking. And, and a lot of the time that means leveraging my trash, sacrificing it in the right way at the right time to give my other units the opportunity to shine and win me the game. And by trash, do you mean like those sacrificial throwing units like land speeders or even something as expensive as like five intercessors? Exactly. And, and I mean, anything can be a trash unit in the right, right time. My no, matrix awesome. guard or or hell, even a unit of infiltrators if push comes to shove. Or Gulliman. Or Gulliman, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I think that was a pretty big shift coming from being a casual player to not, was letting go of the emotional attachment that you have to your models. I think it's, I think it's a funny thing, and, and that was a... I didn't really realize I had it until I started letting go of that emotional attachment. But... People watch, you know, you're, you're in a tournament, you will see people protect a model they really love, even though it's not in their best interest in the game. So I started letting go of that and I've become a better player for it. This is spawning so many questions in my mind, but I'll try to keep it to an order. Here. <laughs> so sure. your, your adaptability as your play style, that's an answer we don't usually get. Usually when I ask this question, I ask this to everybody, it's like aggressive, it's defensive, you know, it's, it's very all in on a direction. Uh, maybe yeah. it's just I play the most broken thing and I don't care what my play style is. I'll play the most broken thing I can optimally. Like what e- players had their own takes on it. I don't know that I've heard adaptability as the answer to that question. And you kind of said, like, basically you have this toolbox style army and you try to adapt it for your situation. So sometimes you'll play like an Eldar list or sometimes you'll play like a Tau list or whatever it is with your Space Marine toolbox. How do you identify game to game to game, what strategy will work against that specific opponent and army? And then, like, how do you execute so many different plans with the same list? That's a good, good set of questions. So it's, there is no black and white to it. Honestly, I think, um, I I think I I follow a philosophy from a book called Blink. Um, If you haven't heard of it, the, the TLDR on the idea behind that book is our brains have the capacity to process so much data subconsciously based on experience. So there's that sort of gut feeling, but it's based off of all the reps that I've gotten against different armies, different scenarios, et cetera. So I won't necessarily base it just off of an army. I won't necessarily base my strategy off of a scenario. And and sometimes I'll even, you know, factor in if I know that player and I know their play style, I will try to come up with a solution and it's yeah there there is no black and white there is no formula to it but generally speaking you know i find that okay if it's a custodies list that's very dreadnought heavy and they're you know they're gonna come take the center i like that that approach myself but i'm not gonna beat them out doing it so that's when i have to adapt and and spread out maybe i'm taking things like behind enemy lines maybe i'm taking things like you know um engage i'm definitely taking merch from a craig you know there are there are certain certain things that are going to happen but you know that that will come depending on the scenario too you know if we're talking about say i'm i'm playing against 
uh, an army like Necrons that have a lot of OPSEC, and I'm playing a scenario like Scouring, well, I know we're going to be in the middle of the board trading back and forth, so I'm going to leverage things like shock tact or shock, yeah, uh, shock tactics as as a secondary, and I'll build my plan around forcing the Necrons to not be scoring their engage, etc. So it it takes a lot of factors into account, and at this point, I I fed my my database enough reps, I think, of ninth edition to be able to confidently trust my gut on it and. Uh, yeah, more often than not, I tend to get it right and have a good game. So you've kind of lived the entire spectrum of like casual player all the way up to winning best overalls, placing really highly at events on the order war ITC team. So yeah. it, it, you've had it, you've experienced all the different walks of 40k in that light, and, and you've also got the hobbyist, the sportsmanship. Like you're, you are the jack of all trades kind of person. And I am my playstyle. Yeah, right, right, right. So with all that in mind. What has been your most difficult pro- part of the process of getting better, and what has been the most rewarding for you? I think the most difficult has been kind of dealing with imposter syndrome, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, so I personal than like a game skill. Yeah, I, I think you know, like it was, it was. I mean, when I got invited onto the Art of War ITC team, that was huge. Um, I didn't feel like I deserved it, you know? And so, and that's, you know, I, I think there's, there's different, uh, there's some people that think they deserve everything in the world and some people think they don't deserve anything in the world. So I felt kind of more towards the latter spectrum when we were talking about my, uh, my gaming success. And, you know, I think that that's been challenging, you know, like, locally players that have been playing me forever and have known me as a casual player you know they they talk some smack friendly but you know it gets to you and then um yeah it's kind of overcoming that has been has been a challenge and you know i gotta say this performance at that uh storm of silence was definitely kind of i think the the last nail in the coffin for my imposter syndrome i'm feeling pretty good about things right now but uh okay. yeah that that would be the hardest part, I think. I, I would have felt terrible if, like, I caused imposter syndrome on you. But honestly, no. From as your as your coach, I can say with all sincerity, you have earned it. Well, thank you. I feel that way too now, <laughs> for what it's worth. Yeah. So, what's been the most rewarding? The most rewarding, honestly, is the sense of community. Like, I, I gotta say, I, I mean, I, <laughs> being the ultramarine fanboy and and being stubborn, like. I find like-minded individuals. I have a little ch- a group chat with some of the finest minds playing the boys in blue in in the world. We're international. The Victrix card. Give them give them my shout out. But uh, you know, like I've got those guys. I've got the Art of War. Like the team is so amazing. I feel like I've engaged more with my local community. I've been traveling in the Pacific Northwest. I've gotten to know some amazing people, and I think that's like. Honestly, I was having a chat with uh, with one of my my friends. Just how rewarding that feeling is when you're like, "Oh, I'm an I'm a known presence in this, and I'm you know I'm giving back in in whatever ways." Like people tell me, "Hey, your painting inspired me to do X, Y, and Z," or like, "I'm you know you inspire me because you're playing this." You know, depending on when in the in the edition we're talking about this C or D tier army and you're you're performing, you know, you're up there in the ITC. So that that sense of community, like otherwise my you know, I, I work a, a pretty good job. I have a pretty good life, but without this community, you know, there's there's definitely less fulfillment in life. I think that's a really great answer. I, I would have expected you. I don't know what I expected you to say, but that <laughs> just wasn't the answer I expected. So, uh, and like it felt genuine. Like when I answered that question, I also would have said something along the lines of the community. So it's so good to see. Yeah, I mean, we we are lucky, and, and I think I think people have sort of these preconceived notions of the competitive scene of anything. And I, I you know what, I did too. But having been part of it now. I, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Like it's, it's some of the some of the most amazing human beings I met. I have met through this hobby, and I would wouldn't change anything. It is wonderful to hear, Cass. So let's transition this just a little bit. 
and talk about this behemoth of a Space Marine army that you somehow pilot to absolute great success on the tabletop. And it looks amazing. What is the list you took to Storm of Silence to, to claim victory of best overall with? So the list, as, uh, as you would expect, starts off with Gilman. Uh, I actually did pay for his Warlord trait in this rendition of the list as well, because I have a lot of different infantry pieces, and I wanted to be able to use the threat of heroic interventions to make my opponent second-guess themselves. So I've got Gilman in there. Got Tiggy. With Veil of Time, Null Zone, Psychic Fortress, I, I've gotten quite used to that sort of setup. Librarian and Phobos Armor, this one throws people for a loop. Um, I kind of use them for a few different purposes, but uh, we can double-click on that. I'll just kind of read it out here. He's got Mind Raid, Temporal Corridor, and he's got the Seal of Oath. Then I've got a whole lot of troops. So I run two Infiltrators. I run an incursor squad and then a big 10-man brick of intercessors with auto bolt rifles. And naturally, the sergeant has a thunder hammer. Then I've got, for the elites, I've got uh, a unit of four aggressors, an ancient with the standard of McCrag inviolate and steadfast example, a chief apothecary with selfless healer and vox, five terminators with thunder hammer, storm shield, a unit of victrix guard, only one Desolation Squad, but I mastercrafted the Vangor Launcher with Supercrack. The aforementioned Double Devastator Squad in the Drop Pod. I run one Missile Launcher, two Grab Heavy Bolter, and then the other squad is a Multi Melta, two Grab Heavy Bolter. And that's the list. Guess you know that looks like straight out like a Battle Force, right? I know. <laughs> Picture <laughs> out of a Space great, It also greatly pleases me. My Devastator Squad almost looks like the Box Art actually, as a result of the loadout I take. Even when you took two of a unit, you loaded their weapons differently and weirdly. Like, what is going on here? That's what we're going to unpack in part two. <laughs> but before we get to part two, usually this is where we would sign off, I have a few more questions for you. Sure. You've very recently been invited to join the Art of War competitive team at the Kansas City Team Tournament held, up, held by Games Workshop at the beginning of June here. And this is like... Our competitive squad is going. We got Jack, Le Jack. I was going to say Jack Lennon. We got Jack Harpster, <laughs> John Lennon, Anthony Vanilla, Alex McDougal, and now yourself. And you're kind of like brand new to this competing at this level of the 40k scene. And maybe yeah. not. I mean, maybe not this level of competition, but kind of surrounding yourself with these people as your teammates. You're relatively new to the ITC team. Is there some? Is there some pressure you're feeling to not play Ultramarines because of their perceived power level? Or, or like, are you so confident with your Ultramarines that you are willing to hang with the best of them? I think, I think it's a combination of I'm feeling very confident about the list uh, and, just, and, and my knowledge of Ultramarines. But I got to say, the team trusts me and wants me to play what I know. And that's been... Like, hell, that helped me feel more confident about my skill. If, you know, some of the best players in the world are like, no, no, Cass, we know you know Ultramarines. We want you playing Ultramarines. That's huge for me. So, right. I'm feeling the good. <laughs> formats work. It's like, if you're going to take Ultramarines, which, you know, Cass knows Ultramarines perfectly fine, it means nobody's taking Iron Hands. No one's taking Dark Angels. It's one Space Marine faction total for the whole team. And there's a whole argument for, like, maybe John on Iron Hands would be an uh, awesome component to your team because he's so ruthless on that kind of army but yeah you know, then what is cast going to play so i love that they're absolutely empowering you to play the stuff you're good even despite like an opportunity cost and perceived power level i think that speaks volumes to how much trust they have for you as a player which is a real thing in a team tournament environment but also like the confidence they have the it's not unfounded like you truly have put some people to the boots with this ultramarine list and on the offset, it really doesn't look offensive, assuming powerful at all. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Before I got the Art of War jersey, I would show up with my Ultramarines t-shirts on. And, you know, you look at my army, you can tell I'm into the hobby part. I, I kind of played it down a little bit. You know, I'm a hobbyist first. Not a lie. Definitely true. But I, I think I, I, I disarmed a lot of people <laughs> before we started playing. You look at my list, you're like, ah. I'm going to smash this guy. And I love 
I love turning that around on people. My favorite moment in any game is when my opponent's just kind of been staring at the board state, looking like a little bit frustrated, but, you know, still friendly game. And they look up at me and they're like, you've given me nothing but bad choices. And I'm just grinning ear to ear. I'm like, yeah, that's how I went with this army. It's so awesome. It's, yeah, it's a good time. Yeah. Is there anything you want to shout out or bring to our attention before we head on over to part two for our patrons? Well, I, uh, I, one thing I, I want to talk about that's kind of near and dear my heart. I, I have been attending a charity event locally that, uh, that has been happening for quite some time. This year, I helped a little bit with the organization of the 40K tournament. I, I want to get more and more involved, and I'm being, being welcome to. So I just kind of want to give a shout out to Toss Your Capers and Food Hammer, which are charity events that we run out of Vancouver. This has been going on since 2015, and since the inception of this event, we have raised over $40,000 to go to the Lookout Society, which actually is a society that's near and dear to my heart that works with the the homeless in Vancouver, and it's a non-judgmental society. So they're helping people who need help the way they need help. And why this is so near and dear to my heart is the neighborhood I live in is right in the heart of the downtown east side of Vancouver. And there's so much tragedy and pain and suffering that these people go through that, you know, we get to help those folks out by playing Warhammer. I mean, what a world we live in. And and the folks that that organize Hasha Capers just are, are it's just a volunteer group. And there's so much love and heart that goes into this event. I've I've just got to shout that out. So that is happening actually the weekend after the teams tournament in Kansas. So if you're in Vancouver, 40k sold out. Sorry, but uh, we're going to be growing next year. So I will be I will definitely be uh, magnifying the advertisements when tickets go up for next year. That's awesome. Uh, any part of 40k charity, I've been involved with many over the years. Art of War has as well. You know, giving back is is a large part of why we do this. Playing games when calling it a job is awesome, but it's got to have some real implications for it to mean something. So I, I just love that you're giving back to the community like that, Cass. Everybody, thank you so much for staying with us for this episode. This is episode 190 of the Art of War podcast. I'm your host, Nick Nondavati. This concludes our episode for today, where we get to know Cass and we get to know how he works. Newest member of the Art of War ITC team. Hopefully you found this episode helpful. If you did, or you're interested in learning more about this Ultramarine's menace on the tabletop, and I'll say maybe less so about this specific list, but a lot about how to play 40K is what you're going to learn in part two. Because um, the tactics Cass is going to use are not necessarily Ultramarine specific, and they, they are like 40K fundamentals applied to the fullest. I am super eager to hear about it. Hopefully you are too. Join us on AOW40K.com. That is for patrons only. Cass, thank you so much for coming on to the show. It was a pleasure having you. Thanks for having me, Nick. Pleasure oh, being here. Of course. Listeners, we will see you later. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com. 